Welcome back everyone. We have a case that's empty. We have a bench that's full. The new gaskets have been made, the new seals have arrived, and I'm fresh out of cow tails. So that can only mean one thing. It's time to get busy on the next episode. Speaking of seals, the only thing I've put into the case so far are the brake cross shaft seals, and I used the SKF 11170s for that. And I've got the old worn constant mesh gear off of the counter shaft and our new replacement constant mesh gear is installed. Shout out to my friends at Jensen Tractor in Asco, Minnesota. They went out in some, well, very less than desirable weather to get this gear pulled out of that parts H for me. So appreciate every bit of that. And we're very much dice rolling here because this is a gear out of a tractor with an unknown amount of hours. This input is out of another tractor with an unknown amount of hours. I'm just hoping to return this transmission to the normal H input wine and just uh, get away from the rabid banshee that we had going on prior. So the reassembly begins. All right, it's about to get a little bit complicated. See if you can follow me. So here are the two counter shaft bearings and we have our front bearing retainer. We need the rear bearing with the snap ring because that has to be driven on to the back of the shaft. Remember, we pulled this off with a puller, so we are gonna have to carefully tap around the inner race, get it seated enough to get that ring in place. And to secure the shaft for this step, I use this older front bearing. This is not the one for this transmission. It's an old worn one that I keep around to use kind of as a tool for this step. And we've also got this pot metal bearing retainer. So outside of the war years, they made these out of this uh, rather low grade pot metal. This is a 1945 war era tractor. It has several of the war era cues. Still has that steel handled shifter. It's got the old steel farmall emblem on the front. You can see it's rusting a little bit. And during the war, instead of this pot metal design for that retainer, they used this cast iron version, which I like a lot better because I think it's a lot stronger. You gotta watch these pot metal ones for deforming around the bolt holes. And as you can tell by all the punch marks around that seal bar, they like to open up and spin the oil seals. So I just keep this, uh, this cheap retainer and this worn bearing around just for this purpose. Snap ring click. Pot metal retainer did its job, as did the old loose bearing. I just need to get it out. There we are. New tight bearing goes in. I like using that old bearing so we could keep the pounding off of the new one that we want to use for good. Back to the heavy cast retainer, the input seal. You can see I, I doubled them up and I packed them with grease because the original was a double lip seal. And I used these uh, SKF 13602s in there. Gasket for it right here. Three bolts. And be mindful of the oil port off the end of my thumb. The hole for it is back here. These cast covers have top written on them, so it's pretty difficult to get them put on incorrectly. I also do thread sealer on these bolts because these are all open holes into the fluid compartment. Something else I like to do as well before I tighten the bolts for this bearing retainer, I'll take the slotted belly pump drive and I will just start it on the shaft. We can't tighten this piece until we get the top shaft put in and we can lock two gears together. But what this does is um, perfectly centers this bearing retainer with the oil seals in it because there's no alignment dowels on this retainer at all. So that's just how I like to make sure I've got even pressure on the seal lip all the way around. Reverse idler gear is next. We'll place it in and then we will verify position because you can put it in backwards and things don't work very well when that happens. So 
So we've got these teeth that are a little bit narrower and these teeth that are a little bit wider. You can also see some witness marks on the fronts of these from that sliding gear up top coming into them. That's how you want to have this set up. If you had it backwards and you had this gear in constant mesh with that one, things aren't going to work very well the first time you try to shift. Sliding gear shaft now. The new input is next. I've already mounted the flange and the new seal. Roll it around. There's the numbers. That's an SKF 18733. We've also got the new gasket and six bolts. All right, I've left all of the pinion depth shims from the old setup in place because in my mind, we're not going to change anything by just swapping the bull pinions with the housings. That should keep our mesh the same, but still, until we know, well, we're not putting any sealer on the gasket for the input or for the bolt threads up here either, because if I have to do a shim adjustment, all that has to come back apart. But we'll do a quick function check on the gears. We have a good neutral spin. Reverse is good. First gear, good. Second gear, good. Third gear, good. Fourth gear, good. And direct fifth, good. Back to neutral, good spin. So all that looks just fine so far. Back to the bench once again, and this is why I do not believe that just swapping these bull pinion shafts in the housings will change any of our gear mesh right here. I had them marked left hand and right hand so that I can put these housings back into the case on the same sides that they originally were. I've swapped the two bull pinion shafts, so we have reversed the gearing right there and right there. But considering how this housing and this housing are going to be in the same spots in the case that they were before, and this area here, as well as this area here, is what holds the bearings that are on either side of the differential. In theory, these bull pinions floating inside should not change any of these other three pieces with their position. That being said though, I'm not going to throw any of the new O-rings onto the bull pinion housings just yet, because it's gonna make it easier to mock all this stuff up, check our contact, know whether or not we're in good shape. Very important step now, make absolutely sure that you put the carrier in if I can start that bull pinion in the area. Make absolutely sure you start the carrier in with the ring gear on the correct side of the pinion. Because if you put it in backwards and you flop that, you'll have five reverse speeds and only one forward. It'll be one heck of a surprise the first time you let out on the clutch. Keeping these shims under control is kind of like herding cats. There we go. And with the bull pinion housings tight, first check is the backlash. We are still nine thousandths unchanged. Contact pattern check. And we still have the same heavy toe contact in the no load state that we did before. And once again, that's what we want. And I'll explain it one more time because this always trips people up that are not used to setting gear sets that are on ball bearing mountings. Ball bearing right here, ball bearing right there. That's deflection. 
ball bearing here, more deflection. The roller bearing between the sliding shaft and the input, lots of deflection, two ball bearings on the input, more deflection still. So in the no load state on this type of gear set, you want to see heavy toe contact because when you put it under load, the ring and the pinion are going to want to drift apart as well as the constant mesh gears at the front are going to want to kick that input slightly up. So that's going to take the sliding shaft off to the side and up a little bit, which will rotate the mesh of the pinion on the ring gear and bring this contact up into the working face of the teeth. That's what you want to have happen. If we were to set this up so that we had proper contact right now in the no load state across the working face of that tooth if we put it into a loaded state it would then drift it up onto the heel we'd still have a noisy gear set so it's not like we're dealing with preloaded taper bearings that hold everything on fixed axes this stuff moves around quite a bit so it's just one of those theoretical things you have to go with it this was whisper quiet before it'll be whisper quiet again as far as the uh, noisy input i'm giving that 50 50 odds it might stay about the same I'm just hoping it gets a little bit better. So moving on, I've finalized everything at the front. Sealer on the gasket, sealer on the threads. I've tightened the slotted drive nut for the belly pump. And now we pull one bull pinion housing out at a time. Get the new O-ring seals down into the grooves and finalize those. And I know when I took this apart, there was a lot of ugly blue silicone around those bull pinion housings. That's because back in 16 when I re-bearinged this the first time, furloughed from BNSF, not sure where my next paycheck was coming from. Having just dumped $800 into ball bearings for the whole back end, I decided that I didn't want to pay $17.99 a piece for new O-ring seals at the time. So we applied liberal amounts of the old Permatex Ultra Blue and said send it. We don't have to do that now, but I'll say one thing. The Ultra Blue did its job. They didn't leak. Moving on, bull gears go in now. The old left side gear is going in on the right because that is going to uh, flip the drive sides of our teeth. We don't want to uh, forget to do this part because this is the whole reason we got into it this far to begin with. And the old right side gear goes in on the left. Play nice, you guys. bench is opening back up. Our new gaskets that we made for the axle housings. Click. Click.
All right, we're up off of the floor again. Up on the jack stands makes it a lot nicer to work on. So to finish out today, I'll throw the brake and clutch pedal cross shaft in. We already discussed the new seals that I put in the case. So just guide it on through. Yep, it's out the other side. We have these backup washers that go in and protect the seals. They just hide inside of a shallow counter bore, flushes out the surface of the case. And finally, I decided to go as far as throwing the brake drums back on. Each one is held on by a bolt lock washer, heavy flat washer, and this cork gasket ring that seals the ends of those splines in case any oil wants to migrate to the outside. One more thing that I just about forgot to mention, I'm not going to replace these brake drum seals at this time because these are not that old and they were absolutely dry when I took it apart. These are some very heavy national brand 416444 seals. They're a very heavy duty, durable, fully encased steel body seal, highly recommended for this application. Let's line the splines. There we go. Another thing I really like about working on these formals is there are no tapered press fits. Everything just slides together by hand. Really makes it a lot easier to work on. We sure did a good job at opening the bench back up today. All we have left here are these bolts, which is, um, this is torque tube to back end. This is engine to torque tube hardware here, and these smaller bolts are for the PTO drive. So next time we will get into the top cover. We will also get into that PTO drive for the rear. We will look at redoing the shifter, maybe even get as far as the torque tube. I don't know yet, but all of those pieces are coming up. I wanna get this back end sealed back up so that we can move on to, well, the whole front half that is sitting there yet. Thank you, as always, everyone, for watching, and I hope to see you back for the next episode.